Now, the one thing about DLM, DLM is not specifically a block lock mechanism. It's used by other cluster resources. Um, so, I don't, know, I don't want to get too much into it at this point, but even if you don't have clustered storage, if you're using RG Manager, for example, which uses DLM as well, the idea being that your two nodes, two nodes boot up, a particular service can run on either of them. It goes to start it. The first node's going to ask for a lock for RG Manager. says, I want to start the service. Can I have a lock, please? It gets it, starts starting the service. The second node comes along and says, can I have a lock, please? I want to start the service. It can't. So DLM is not storage specific. The cluster uses it for numerous things. And because DLM is what requires fencing to clear the state, you will need fencing even if you're not using CLAM shared storage. That last part, though, is something that is very cluster specific. Yes. So um, the, the concept of a service lock as such exists in RG Manager CMAN clusters, aka formerly known as Red Cluster Suite, now known as the <coughs> Enterprise Linux High Availability Add on. It's a great product name. Um, uh, and this being something RG Manager specific, here is something that's pacemaker specific. Um, and this is actually a pretty neat way of, of using fencing. Consider the following problem. You have a perfectly uh, defined uh, cluster resource. Everything is fine. It's been humming along normally for quite a while. And now for whatever reason, it could be a manual intervention, it could be a uh, pacemaker detecting a change in system utilization and therefore initiating a, uh, a resource uh, migration to another node that's less utilized. Um, and we now need to stop that specific cluster resource. And as you know, a cluster resource is pretty much anything that a cluster managers, that there, manages. There's no formal definition of what a, what a resource is other, other than if a cluster manages it, then it's a cluster resource. It can be an IP address, file system, can be uh, a database daemon, file service, whatever it may be. Um, and now you want to take such a resource and migrate it off to another node, which means you stop it here and you bring it back up there. Now, the cluster now initiates the stop action. So it now instructs the local resource manager, okay, I want this resource to be shut down now. And for whatever reason, that shutdown now fails. So we have a, a resource that's hanging while attempting to be stopped. That is potentially a really, really bad situation because the resource might still have access to something on, for example, shared storage. It could be your database daemon that's not shutting down and it still has file handles open and those file handles have happened to live in an EXT3 file system which is on a, on a, on a, on a fiber channel SAN SCSI one. <coughs> and now you've got something and you're not quite sure if it still, if it still has uh, any shared resources open. And now Pacemaker can use its fencing facility to remove the node from the cluster that way even on a failed stop. That's kind of neat because um, the work alike in RG Manager is the resource simply goes to a failed state and then we need manual intervention which can potentially you know, bring your downtime up quite a bit that's, um, that's caused by this situation. Whereas in Pacemaker, we can resort to the fencing infrastructure to forcibly remove that node from the cluster, which is an admittedly brutal way of ensuring that the resource has in fact properly stopped and doesn't have any, any uh, access or doesn't hold any handles on shared resources anymore, but it's very, very effective. So that's another way where fencing can greatly help us. We get um, we get stop failures on resources, or whenever we get stop uh, failures on resources, there is a way out by just completely removing the node altogether um, and then taking that specific resource and bringing it up on a different node. That's kind of a neat feature, a neat way of, of utilizing fencing. And if you really want, you can turn that off. If you really want, you can turn it off. Yes, it's a, it's a default behavior. That's quite smartly so. But if you if you really you can actually do that on a, not only on global but also on a per resource basis. But you, so you can, if you really, really want it, you can have a specific resource saying, "I know this thing never accesses shared resources. Therefore, a stop can be safely ignored for fencing purposes." An example being an IP address. An IP address basically just lives in your kernel, and that's it. Uh, it certainly doesn't have access to shared resources. That being said, though, even for an IP address, I wouldn't turn it on. I mean, I wouldn't turn it off. I wouldn't turn it on. <laughs>
brings us directly to, to the question I wanted to ask. Mm -hmm. Of course, I understand how that you know, data clean and everything, mm -hmm. uh, but how does that help you to ensure your service? Because usually your service is an IP-based service. Mm -hmm. So you have to ensure that the other side, which is sweet behavior, is they, they taking away its IP address so yeah. that, that you can bring it up and which is why it's a good idea to yeah. leave, the, leave the fence auction on yeah. for any resource. Well, and, and uh, I yeah. was talking now about the, the fabric fencing. Because if you uh, turn off the access to the, to the storage, okay, you keep your data clean. But that, 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 must, well, that doesn't keep this the bad guy then, from taking yeah. uh, the chance of the uh, network. The idea behind that then is that your services will still continue on the other nodes in the cluster. Just that particular node that's misbehaving has been taken out of the picture. Of course, but uh, actually you want to start this service somewhere else because you have to... And that can happen. Yeah. Once it's been fenced, you can recover it, any of your services elsewhere in the cluster. Yeah, but the point, point of course, but this guy is still having the IP yeah. address. So the, point, so the point that you're making, namely that node-level fencing is much more effective in achieving what you want to achieve in that case is entirely valid. Just wanted to ask, yeah. what are you going to do in addition? Well, you could, of course, think of this guy is uh, on a switch and that turn off his network interfaces. Uh, you provided the services with as well. Then you're back again. On the There's some side. people who like it because if a machine fails, they don't want it to be shut down. They want to go in and analyze the failure. Fabric fencing is a way of disconnecting it. So even if it has an IP address, it doesn't matter. It's not going to interfere with anyone because you cut off its network access. There are risks to it. Um, but it comes down to having choices. Now, one thing, just so we get back on, um, with regard to the software, I want to bring back to our manager is that with the um, file system, clustered file system, and logical volume management resource types, you can enable an option called self fence. So, on failure, it actually fences itself. So, what can go wrong with fencing? The probably by far the number one fence agent is using IPMI or one of its ilk. Now, the problem with that is that it's ideal. When it works, it is by far the preferred fence method because you're actually talking to a component within the server that can check the state of the server. But it shares its power supply with the server. So if you've had a failure that has taken out the power supply, and if you've ever done power supplies, I'm sure most people here have at one point or another in the past seen a case where something cut one of the wires coming from the power supply to the motherboard, shorted out, blew it. And the point is, is that it does have an Achilles heel. So if you rely solely on your IPMI for fencing and you lose the power supply, the cluster blocks, calls the fence device or the fence agent. The fence agent tries to reach out and talk to the IPMI or the other out of band management, gets no response. And remember in clustering, the only thing you don't know is what you don't know. Just because it's not answering doesn't mean you can trust it's truly dead. All you know is you can't talk to it. So, one of the ways you can prevent against that being a single point of failure is introducing a switched PDU as a backup device. The, in that case, what would happen is it would come along, try to talk to the IPMI board, fail, time out, and fall back on the PDU, which is set up as a backup fence device. The PDU being completely outside the server, and preferably on the second switch, you can reach out to and say, cut the power. But that's not the, you always want to keep the PDU as your backup because the PDU, as we mentioned earlier, cannot reach into the server to confirm the machine is truly down. What, another option that you have, if you don't have access to a switch PDU, is to um, have a nice and relaxed chat with your server vendor. Uh, because there's, uh, it's becoming more and more common for vendors to offer servers with IPMI BMCs with either BBUs or supercapacitors slapped on them. So what's kind of neat about that is even after you cut power to all the power supplies in the machine, then you still, for a considerable time, still have power to the IPMI devices. And what that means is that another of the cluster nodes can now talk to the IPMI device and verify that it's down. So it's something that works. Um, this is actually something that I just did uh, not too long ago on a, on a couple of Dell servers and used exactly that. It was basically IPMI over their direct devices and it worked beautifully because uh, you could just you, you could walk up to the service, yank out all the cords, and um, the, the other node would detect that, would be able to still talk to the IPMI device with the power it had left. I don't actually know, I actually don't remember if it were BBUs or, or capacitors on the thing, but anyhow, plenty of power left. 
And so another node could verify that the node was in fact down through the IP my device. And of course, uh, when we fence, one thing we do, or one thing that the fencing agents do is, is that guy down already? And if it's confirmed to be down already, then there is no need for extra fencing. And that's exactly what happens there. The node goes away, uh, the, uh, it's being scheduled for fencing, the other node now says, okay, let's talk to the IP, my BMC, goes over the wire, talks to that guy, and says, and from that guy hears, okay, this node is already down, and then the failover can proceed normally. So, two things that you really want to do here. Uh, one, you want to be on the lookout for servers with IP, my BMCs, or the vendor-specific equivalent that can survive the power failure, at least for a minute or two. That's just fine for clustering. Uh, or, if that's not available, then do consider a backup plan. A backup fencing plan, that is. If your fencing over your IP mine doesn't work, come back to a different device. Even if that other device is human intervention, if that's your procedure, if that's your plan, that's fine too. You just want to have a backup and not worry about manually uh, re-enabling cluster services when problems do occur. Um, what's also a good, uh, another good reason for always having a backup fencing device are things like, and this is something that I've, um, that I've seen happen uh, in, 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 a, in a customer, is that you've got your highly motivated security team that has to enforce a security policy, which among other things says that every single password has to be changed at least twice a year. That also including the passwords of the IPMI interfaces and the highly motivated security team not telling the equally highly motivated infrastructure team about that fact. So they're changing the passwords, fencing no longer works, and no one really knows about it. Next time they actually have an outage in one of their boxes, Everything basically stops dead for three hours until they find out the root cause of the problem, why fencing isn't working. Luckily, Pacemaker has a nice little feature to prevent against that as well. Um, in Pacemaker, the fencing agents are not really very, very specially treated for, for, the, for the most part. They're just a cluster resource. And like a cluster resource, they can be monitored. So it will actually periodically check, do I still have access to that IP my device with the configured credentials, and if not, then that's a failed resource, and that means that we have to uh, we have to intervene and fix the issue. So it won't go unnoticed. If you configure it right, if you do it right, it won't go unnoticed in a pacemaker cluster, at least not for long. That is until your next monitor action is scheduled, which is usually on the order of 60 seconds. <laughs>